everybody, uh, this is Victoria Baylor, one half of the Taylor and the Dressmaker, and this is... Gentleman Jim, the other half, the Taylor. One of our most spectacular other halves. Um, we're glad to have you back. We well, missed you, you last much. week. I miss you guys too, <laughs> but I had some business to take care of, you know, in, in life. Did every now and then you have to do that. Can understand that. Can yeah. understand that. Well, this um, episode actually centers around all things coats, which is really exciting. Yes, it is. Um, so we're going to talk about just Mr. Jim. We're going to let him take it away from most of this episode, since this is kind of his uh, forte and his strong suit. Uh, this episode will just deal mainly with all the tips, some of your tips, your mm -hmm. I said tips, mm -hmm. some of your tricks, your techniques, mm -hmm. and insights in regards to sewing coats. So, um, anything you want to say before we kind of get started? Well, uh... What can people look for? Just that the things that I do, I always tell everybody. Well, let me, let me reverse that a little. The things that you had been doing, there's nothing wrong with them. There's nothing wrong with them. I just look at showing you a faster method, some things that we use in the tailoring part of the industry, that's not used anymore. Now, when I say that, I want you guys to understand, you can make a very good garment, you can make a good garment, and you can make a garment that you don't want to wear. I always tell all of my students, never give a client of yours something that you wouldn't wear. It's as simple as that. That's the truth. And on the set today, we're surrounded by some of Mr. Jim's coats. You can see one over my shoulder, one over his shoulder. He'll give you a breakdown about the styling of those coats, fabrications. We have some other things that are pretty cool through this episode. Um, we're talking details, uh, hardware, how to change up the look of a coat. And then we're going to actually plug, which we're really excited about, Mr. Jim's um, coat course which is actually coming out and it'll be available as this episode airs. So that's exciting for those who would like to learn how to sew a coat like a master tailor. Now, how does one do that, essentially? Someone like a master tailor. All it is, is like I say, within the confines of this show, there's the points, the tips that I make. If you do those things, it adds to the way the garment hangs, the way the garment looks. Uh, master tailoring mainly means that there's really nothing in the tailoring industry that I don't know how. Now I always tell all of my students, I'm a very, very good sewer, but I have some of my students that outsew me. So that doesn't mean that because I'm the master tailor, I'm the best sewer in the world. I'm not. There are people that actually outsew me. What I've done was to be able to do it all. That's what makes you a master. Can you do it all? And that's the one thing that I do. Some people are just tailors. They can't do it all, but they sew an extremely well-made garment. And to that, I tip my hat to all of those. But I just do it all when I say that. I do the cutting, the patterns, the layout, the finish. I do the whole garment, and to that, that's what makes me a master. Not that I'm the greatest sewer. There are a lot of great sewers out there, and that's what you guys have to strive to be. Oh Lord, I don't think you done broke the internet. Everyone, people done fainted on the other side of the camera. <laughs> no, I But I get what you're saying though, sure. and I think that covers a huge misconception that people have about sewing. It's not, if you think of it like grading, um, your performance. Mm -hmm. You have all these different categories that oh, you mentioned. Absolutely. There's the absolutely. cutting, there's the sewing, there's all that. Absolutely. When you can get high marks in all those areas, oh, yeah. they create an overall mm -hmm. great look. But if you're just good in one area and you get an A in that one area, you get D's and F's and the cutting and everything else, oh, what do you think that garment's going to look like? Oh, so I like yeah. that you mentioned that. So for the person out there, like you always encounter, and I do too, mm -hmm. who's always talking down and don't think they can, you know, sew very well or they can put things together, Mr. Jim just told you, you can master the craft. It's all about doing Absolutely. every step very well. So Absolutely. I like that. And I appreciate your humility, even though I think he's, he's a master at everything. Thing, as he yeah. mentioned. <laughs> okay, so let's go ahead and get started. All right. Uh, Mr. Jim's going to go to the table and start talking about his coats. I want to talk a little today about coats. As you can see, these are some coats that I have made, different styles, 
This is more of a fitted coat. I'm going to give you a lot of the highs and lows on what happens with a fitted coat. This one here is a wrap coat. This one here is kind of just a little boxy three-quarter length coat. Now I'm going to give you a few pointers, a few highs and lows on all three of these. Because the only other style coat you would get would be kind of a swing coat. So you're either going to have a real tailored fit, a little nice wrap fit, which is still fitted, or one that's a little boxier. Now what makes the coat is the length. This would be more of a three-quarter jacket coat. This would be more of a full-length coat. This would be kind of a tween, in between. And that determines on a lot of things. That determines on the person, the height of the person. Now let me say something about height. A lot of people wear a coat that's the wrong cut for them. Now, if it's a shorter person, okay, if it's a shorter person, you really don't want to make too long a coat. Here's why. You cut off the leg, so it almost looks like that person is standing in a hole because there's very little leg showing and you got all this coat. And I always tell them, don't make the coat too long. Where, where you finish the coat for a longer coat, a good length, is mid-calf for a woman, or a little between the mid-calf point and below the knee. Notice how I said below the knee. Because two things happen. What you don't want to see is the length of a coat and just a little bit of the dress or the skirt or whatever they wear is showing. You need to either cover it or let it be really long enough to where you know that that's what's under there. So that determines the length. And a lot of women wear coats that are really the long length, length for their height. Secondly, you don't want a coat that looks sloppy or froppy around the shoulders. Now I hear this all the time because a lot of patterns, they make all this area up in here too wide. This is one of the things that's in my coat course about widths of shoulders. What looks good, what doesn't. Because what you don't want is the shoulder cap, this is the cap here, hanging way over here where it's off the shoulder. So those are the things that you want to look out for. Now, what type of fabrics that you use? To me, it depends on the style of the coat. I've made a lot of coats, and a lot of times you really don't know what that coat is going to do till you physically make it up. You can look at a piece of fabric, cut it out, say, oh, this would look good in this specific pattern. But until you physically make it out, you don't know the nature of the fabric. And if you don't know the nature of the fabric, you don't know what it's going to do. So up until you physically made the garment, then you don't know. Now, when you think about what manufacturers do, oh, trust me, they go through a product development of every piece of fabric that they use in making a specific garment before they put it into production. We think, oh, that's a nice coat, and they just made it up. They went through a lot of product and development, that old P and D syndrome, where they've taken a piece of fabric, made up the garment, saw how it does, what it does, and all of the above. We don't always know. Now, a lot of garments, they look good, but we don't know how good they are once again until we make them. This coat right here, Looks nice, feels nice, but doesn't have a real good tight weave on it. This is called pilling, when you see it like that. That's called pilling. Now, what happens is the fabric content leaves the main function and body of the fabric. And this comes from you either putting your elbow down on something, carrying something under your arm. You get, you get it in different areas for different reasons. A lot of times you get that rub across the shoulders because you women put the bag over the shoulder. Now you have to do that anyway, but you don't start noticing things until you want it. When we make coats up, we don't always know what they're going to do. Until it's physically made, somebody wears it, and we see the final results. Sometimes you just can't help it, you know. You want the coat, it looks good, 
and certain things go wrong with it. When you sew a coat, when you sew a garment, what you look to do is, you should always hear this phrase when you make something. Oh, that looks like it came right out of the store. It's supposed to. Because then it looks homemade. What makes a, a coat look homemade, or any garment for that matter, is, number one, what I always stress, your straight stitching. How well did you put that in? Your seams, where they don't have a lot of puckers in them. You don't want a lot of puckers around here. When you see puckers like that, that's when it looks homemade. When the shoulder sits in cleanly, it looks professional. This is what we guys, this is what we're all striving for to have professional looking garments. The finish is good. The lining sit is sat in well. You want to make sure that it doesn't overhang. You know, a lot of times, ladies, you put your arm in a coat and the lining pulls down like that. These are the things that makes the garment look more professional. When you see a lot of things go wrong, you don't want to make it that way. Now, let me tell you something. Industry makes them like that because they don't really care anymore. But you guys are entering into, I want to make that coat. I want to make it for me or whoever you make it for. And I want it to look good. You want to be able to put on a garment. And people say, wow, I like that. Oh, that's uneven. Oh, that's puckered. Oh, those stitches aren't straight. That's what you don't want to hear. You just don't want to hear those things. So, that's kind of a few tips on coats. I'm going to get into a few other things right now, but as far as the coat and the look, you want to be able to either you wear a coat and it looks good, or one of your clients or family members that you made it for, put it on, and people compliment you on what you're wearing or what they're wearing. Listen to me. You don't ever want to have a coat on where somebody doesn't say something about it. I don't care what it is. I don't care what time or day you wear it, this, that, and the other. When a person says, you look very nice in that coat or whatever else you're wearing, that's when you know your garment looks good. So that's what we strive for when we do coats. All right, what I have here is a variety of different coat patterns. Now, what I had talked about earlier was the length of the coat. Notice you don't see any dress or skirt below this length. So what that's telling you is you shouldn't wear a skirt or dress where you see just a little bit. Either you need to see the leg or you need to see enough of the dress where you know that's a long gown or a long dress there. So you have long, you have knee length coat. These are knee length. This is more jacket length of a coat. Then we have several different lengths. Most all patterns have a cutoff line for different lengths. You can get into jackets, wrap coats, and so on and so on. They're all kind of lengths. They're all kind of styles. You can get creative with a style and change it up somewhat. Doesn't have to be identical to what the pattern calls. You can add, delete, and just keep on going with different styles, different lengths, different everything. Now, pick a coat out that you're going to wear. And by that, by that I mean do you have a purpose for that coat? Is it an everyday coat? Is it a going out occasionally coat? Is it a one-time coat? And a lot of people do everything one time. Then you should select the fabrics that complement the coat, from plaids to tweeds to solids, all of the above. The weight of the coat should basically determine on where you live and the climate of uh, the area that you live in. Lightweight coats, you can get into heavier weight wools. This one is even heavier. 
this piece of fabric right here. This is heavier. In the South, you don't need something too heavy. You want something kind of a medium weight or lightweight. Now, in the South, you can get away with a lightweight. This is a lightweight wool. This is a wool gabardine. This coat here would look better. This coat here would look better in a styling like that, like one of these. The heavier weight wools would look better in something like this, or one of these. And like I say, it depends on where you live. So judge making something by where you live and the climate that you're in. You don't want to be too hot. You don't want to be not warm enough. The linings that I use to go in coats, it has weight, has body to it. This is not, some linings are too flimsy. And you don't want that. You want a lining that has some weight and some body to it. Now you hear people talk about Bamberg. Bamberg is just an expensive lining. It's not necessarily better, it just costs more. You hear people talk about silk linings, Silk is not a good fabric for a lining because it wears out too easy. Then you have some linings where people put an inner lining. I'll just show this is what I'm talking about. They put an inner lining in a coat to add for warmth. Well, that works in some cases. I don't like them because what happens is the lining, unless it's adhered, to, or the interfacing that you put in the lining needs to be directly on it to keep it from shifting because it will move and then if it's heavier than the lining it'll make the lining sag. They used to make a lining called Skinner Sunback and all that was was a lining that had like a felt-ish type feeling but it was fused directly onto the lining that would move. If it separates and moves, you don't know what the consistency of that is going to do. And a lot of times it rolls up and it wads up inside and then all of a sudden you had a garment on and you feel like there's something inside it. It is. This is messed up on the inside. Okay. Another thing that people aren't sure is when we talked about the fit on the garment in the shoulder area, an outer coat usually determines that you're going to wear something under it, either a sweater or a jacket or something to that nature. So you want to make sure that your shoulder cap is wide enough to accommodate that. Otherwise, it feels like the garment is too tight in this area. And we talked about sizing up shoulders. Well, when you make the coat, Always consider, well, what am I going to wear under this? If you make the coat for an individual, ask them. Do not be afraid to ask them. Just don't make them up a style because they like it, and you make it up and all of a sudden, well, I want to wear a jacket up under this, and you've made no provision for that. So you ask questions up front. You're going to wear a jacket under this? You're going to wear a bulky sweater? Is it going to be a turtleneck? Is it going to be more of a shell type? Whatever you're going to wear up under there because the comfort is what you need on a coat. So those are a few things. Now, another thing that makes garments different are buttons. What kind of buttons do we use? We use plastic buttons. We use wooden buttons. We use brass buttons. Uh, sometimes they're covered buttons. There are all kind of buttons that are used. So when you consider a garment, consider the buttons that you want to use. What size do you want to use? Like I say, these are leather buttons. Then you have some type of brass button that's used on some garments. Other times you have plastic buttons. 
that are used. And once again, depending on the garment or where it is, you determine what kind of button am I going to put on this coat. Well, you want to put one on that shows a good coloration in it. Now, this is like a pearl button right here. Right? has like an oval shape. Or you can do a round button. Another thing on buttons, so that you'll understand. When you see a button, when you go to buy a button, generally, if it has two holes, that's for a lady's garment, whether it's a coat, a jacket, or what. If it has four holes, that's generally a man's coat or a man's jacket. See, so you have the one with four holes, you have the ones with two holes. Two holes is generally women, four holes is generally men's. Those are some of the things that you should look for. There's nothing wrong if you put the wrong amount of holes on the wrong jacket, because most people don't know anyway. But that's just the way it goes. That's, that, that's the way it was designed. Two holes for women, four holes for a man. Now, I don't know why they designed that, so don't be asking me why. I just don't know. But that's, that's what happens when it comes to buttons. The fabrics, once again, like I explained, come in all different patterns, print, shapes, and weight. So choose wisely of a fabric. Sometimes you'll pick a fabric and it has a very loose weave on it. Now you have to always remember, something with too loose a weave is subject to get snagged. Women wear rings, the corner of the ring sometimes catches it and it snags it. Sometimes you wear a watch and the watch has stem or bracelet, it snags it. So you have to always be mindful of the fabric, the content of the fabric, the content of the weave, and mainly, is it going to be either warm enough or cool enough in the climate of where I'm going to be, or if you're making it and you're sending it to somebody, always ask them, what kind of weather do you have there? How's the climate? These are questions you should always ask a person or yourself, because in the long run, and I do mean in the long run, you don't want to make a garment or you don't want to wear a garment where it's either not warm enough or it's too warm. So all of these things uh, you have to consider when you make coats. Okay, so we're ready for our next segment. Hopefully, I think everybody enjoyed you hitting the table, showing fabrics, oh, styles. I, it. I know you do. You always enjoy talking about coats, mm -hmm. and we always enjoy listening to you talk about coats because you have a lot of great insights. Well, let me tell you one thing. What's that? About coats. I really enjoy making everything, especially vests and whatnot. But I did some coach years ago when I was very successful because the way I put them together. But then I switched off of coach and now I'm back on coach again because I just, I like to see a woman or a man well dressed. And I like to create a garment that just doesn't look like everybody else's, whether it's the fabric or the style. That's true. And with that being said, I hope it's not too early to kind of let the cat out of the bag, but some of your, uh, you were probably leaning toward doing a little bit of coat manufacturing, small scale yourself? Well, Will not you, really. Did you say? Not, uh, okay, you can say <laughs> that there. Did I put you I, out there? I, I'm coming out. <laughs> I'm coming out with a signature line of coats. Every coat will be one of a kind. And when I say one of a kind, I never make the same thing twice. So I'm going to put some coats out there, and they're going to be at a moderate price for those who want a Gentleman Jim signature coat. Each one will only be one of a kind. So no, your friends or colleagues can't get the same coat. So that makes you a real special person because you're real special to me. Okay, so I, I apologize. I did put them on blast, but I think that's exciting news for those who are interested because a lot of you have actually asked about Mr. Jim's coats. Okay, so let's move on. We are actually going to talk now about a portion of this um, 
this segment that I'm really excited about is your new upcoming Coats course. Mm -hmm. And for people that don't know, a lot of people I've watched over the last couple of years have really inquired hard about how does Mr. Jim actually construct coats so fast. And I, I, I'm in shock with him, so I watch him do this, literally. Like in a matter of maybe four or five hours, he can have a complete coat done. So I've seen his time-saving techniques, his strategies, how he puts things together. What's great is he's actually put a video together and a course so we all can get that information. So we're going to talk about that now and do a little Q&A with Mr. Right. Jim uh, to get a little bit more insight into this course. So I, my first question for you is, um, because I know a lot of viewers might want to know this, what do you feel like is the biggest challenge for anyone sewing a coat? Sewing a coat. The biggest challenge is, I always go back to what I say all the time, the fundamentals of sewing. If your fundamentals aren't good, your coat looks not good. Fundamentals, I go over them over and over again. I make my students repeat it. I make the new students come in, listen to the older students that are in here. They have to listen to it. Sewing straight, putting zippers, and pockets in a garment. And those are the three fundamentals. Now, a lot of coats have zippers in it. So if you follow what I'm saying, a lot of coats have pockets in them, but every garment that you make must, 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 must be sewn straight. A lot of coats, see, have a top stitching on it. Has to be straight, has to be straight. So that's the most difficult thing for a lot of people and in a lot of my coursing, I give the fundamentals over and over again. I repeat them over and over again. I want them to understand that when they sew straight, the garment looks professional. When they could set a zipper in straight, the garment looks professional. When they make a nice clean pocket, their garment looks professional. I have students that come to me, been sewing for years, but never mastered the fundamentals because they just figure, well, I'm sewing. Yeah. But look at how you're sewing. And you're so right because a lot of us or sewers will attribute good sewing toward, they'll make it in respect to the garment. So it's like, oh, you know, I, I can sew a blouse and make it look nice, but you know, I struggle with jackets. But that shouldn't be the, the no, case. it never should be. No, because you're right, the same thing goes into both. Yeah. Really good sewing skills. And then the other challenge is actually how to put the coat together. So tell us a little bit about what makes your techniques a lot different from what people Okay. read in patterns or in books okay. on construction. Listen to me. I use what I call my time-saving methods because time in this industry equates to time and time is money. Whether you're making something for yourself or you're making it for an individual. So my methods always come right back down to what I call my basics. Once I have cut my garment out, I have prepared my garment, I physically stack it in order of sewing. A lot of the descriptions that you get in patterns and in books and a lot of times give you step one, step two, step three, and so on and so on. And what does it say after each one? Sew piece one and two together and press the seam open. You know I don't steps. like that. <laughs> Why can't you sew piece one and two together, three and four together, five, as many straight pieces as you can physically sew together, sew them all one time. There's your time management right there. So that means that you only have to get up one time to go to an ironing board, which is never near you. You're always either across the room, around the corner, wherever, and press all the seams open one time then start to master putting them together. To me, that saves so much time from the onset. I sit down and I sew a coat, and in 20 minutes or less, I have put every straight seam together. Then I go and press it. Every time I sew piece one and two together, and then I get up from my sewing machine, and I go to an ironing board and press it open, only to do what? stack it over here. I just peel them off, sew them off. 
That's right. And I've seen them do it. And it's amazing because I actually used to do that. I used to follow the instructions and it's, it's a major time sink. Oh, I don't yeah. think most people know that. Well, in addition to those time saving techniques, Mr. Jim actually does, I think you do your, your lining differently, the way you handle that, that's pretty unique. The way he handles and constructs his collars is actually really neat. Um, a lot of the steps that he implements actually prevent issues later on down the line in the construction what you want. process. Yeah, what you want. So the flow is really neat and I think that this course definitely captures that, which is really great. And I think it takes the intimidation factor out of sewing coats, even for the beginner. Oh, it's yeah. really simple. Oh, it's yeah. not a hard garment to oh, sew. Yeah. And I used to yeah. be terrible. Yeah. I had to kind of sew them myself. Technically speaking, technically speaking, a coat is actually easier to make than a jacket. Absolutely. And I totally it's agree with that. Easy. That's yeah. right. There's more inner workings in the jacket yeah, than well, it is yes. in the coat. Oh, yes. Totally. Oh, yes. Totally. Oh, yes. So let's see what else we can ask you. Um, some other big questions from sewers are, uh, you talked about fabric earlier. There's this whole dividing line about whether to pre-treat versus non-pre-treat. Mm -hmm. Weigh in on that for us. Now, textiles, which are what we start with, supposed to be. Now, notice how I said supposed to be. What's called sponged. Sponged is the word that's used in the industry, only meaning as pre-shrunk. A lot of times you see people and they either dry clean the garment or this that, and the other. I'm not telling you not to do that if that's what you want to do. Right? But a piece of cloth should have been, should have been pre-shrunk, pre-everything. Now what you do not find on a lot of garments, and that depends on the garment, where you're going to wear it, where you live, mm -hmm. is like a scotch guarding. That's true. Like a scotch guarding. They don't do that for you because some places you don't need it. Well, if you live in a damp climate or something like that, finish the garment first. Then go get you a can of scotch guard and spray the garment. You know? And then when it dries, it's now it's scotch guarded. That's something that you can do. But the fabric should be pre-shrunk. Now, most most fabrics in today's world have some type of synthetic blend in them. Mm -hmm. Polyester, rayon. That's true. There was a time when polyester was shone up all oh, polyester. In today's world, you don't know the difference. You really don't. You don't know the difference in is it polyester because they've refined the process of making cloth. Now, when you get a garment that has a, some type of polyester base, always remember this. If it's mixed, it'll breathe. If it's 100% polyester, it Ooh, won't breathe. Oh Jesus, it'll be it hot. It just won't breathe, <laughs> right, see? But if you get a polyester mixture in a garment, and most garments today are, you get cotton and polyester, wool and polyester, this and polyester, and all mm -hmm. that. Let me tell you what that does for you. Number one, the polyester is the strength. The garment will actually last longer if it has polyester base in it, mm -hmm. then an all wool product. If you deal with a product that's all wool, that manufacturer should have pre-shrunk that fabric. Yet, all fabric still shrinks to a point, but the percentage is so small. In due course, you'll find that if it's a trouser or something like that, it will technically shrink up. No one knows when that period comes, but in due course, if you keep the garment long enough, that will happen. Nothing is foolproof to where it's never going to shrink. That's right? true. But that has a lot to do with the content on it. Even the polyester bases, they shrink too. See, So don't be afraid of buying a piece. I always tell people, they say, well, what type of fabric should I buy? I say, feel it. If it feels good, buy it. What it's made out of, don't worry about that because it's not a uniform where you wear it every single day. You wear it periodically. That's true. So if you wear it periodically, who cares? You That's know, who true. cares? The more clothes you have in your rotation, the longer the garment lasts. If you have to wear it constantly, 
then you have to clean it constantly. Mm -hmm. And it's the cleaning of any garment, I don't care what the fabric is, is what destroys it, not the wear. Not the wear, it's the cleaning. That's true, and that's a very good point. So hopefully that'll take some of the wrestling that happens when people, when they're mm -hmm. trying to determine the fabric. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked a little bit earlier, and one thing also Mr. Jim mentioned is if you buy fabric from a reputable dealer, mm -hmm. you can worry a lot less about whether you're gonna have major shrinkage versus Absolutely. not. Absolutely. Um, and then the other thing I, I'll chime in and give a little suggestion on is that those finishings that are on fabrics, just be, you know, tune your eyes in to see. Sometimes you can see that sheen that doesn't look like it's really, you know, is prone for that type of fabric. Usually that's kind of that finishing starchy stuff and yeah, you wash yeah. or treat it and then it goes away and your fabric doesn't look anything like the nothing, way you, you bought it. Uh, be aware of that kind of stuff. But in, in the end, just play, have some fun, yeah, get some good yeah, feeling fabric. Yeah. If your feelers are off, then go somewhere where there's really good fabric, mm -hmm. touch things, and then your hands will start to recognize whether Absolutely. something's good. Yeah. Um, really good tips. Uh, let's see what else do we have here. Hmm, well I think that might just cover it all. You talked about your time saving methods. Um, what are the part of the coat do you think is most difficult for some people to sew? What's the most challenging aspect? If it's a coat with a collar, it's setting the collar in place. Mm -hmm. Now I have that method on my information that's out there on the best way to get a collar to lay down in the back. That method is there. Setting the sleeve in would be probably the most challenging for a lot of people because you have to get that fullness in the crown. That's right. Now, outside of that, everything else is Just straight, straight stitching. stitching. That's all it is. Boys and girls, all it is. <laughs> so it's pretty simple. Um, so we're not, again, well, I guess we are trying to simplify it. Let's just get real. Yeah. Let's just take all the stigma out of sewing coats. Oh, yeah. um, I was yeah. watching, I was looking at someone's blog the other day and they just were mentioning like, well, it takes so much time and so much effort and I just get nervous when I sew coats. So I just really need to kind of center myself. Well, hey, just get this course. That's it. <laughs> you'll be, you'll be fine. After you see it, you you'll, really will be. you'll think like, well, man, that's all it entailed. No. Uh, so great. So we just wanted to kind of, as always present yeah. great resources for you because in our hearts all we're concerned about is having you guys so enjoy life worry less stress less about the sewing and just get what you want in the finished garment so that's what I we're make about. and people always ask me and this is the truth I make a complete coat in about four hours do I expect you guys to do that no I told you I wasn't the greatest sewer my students that so well make them in four hours. It didn't happen overnight, but in due course, they make them that fast. I used to make them faster than that, but I'm slow now. His but, slow is still faster than most of ours fast, trust me. <laughs> but, when, but that's because I use the fundamentals so that's well. That's right, that's true. Okay? I don't have to stop and pick something out or go over it again. That's where you guys lose the time. That's why I say your fundamentals are so well. You sew it, it's crooked, you take it out. Then you sew it, you get most of it straight again, but you still got a crooked part in it, and you take it out. The time is lost, not in the physical stitch. The time is lost in taking the stitch out and yeah. making it straight. Unfortunately. That's true. So hopefully we've given you something to think about or a lot mm -hmm. of good tips to think mm -hmm. about. The last thing, and we actually got in a conversation about this earlier, last important tip, in addition to sewing straight, you want to be able to have a great way to meld those seams. So you want to have a really good iron. So behind us is a gravity feed iron or, you know, where you put the water in the, the top portion and it feeds down. Um, you can use an iron like that or you can use just a really good regular iron that you just press with. Make sure it generates good steam so you can press those seams um, and make it look good. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Pressing could make a bad garment. Not look great, but it can make it look good. <laughs> that's right. It can salvage some not so good garments. That's very true. Okay, so this concludes our course today, uh, or yeah. not our course, well, his course introduction. In addition to this episode, we hope mm -hmm. you kind of got a better feel for sewing coats, are excited about the cooling weather to oh, kind of yes, start. I love it, I love it. 
pulling out those coats and making some new ones. I'm planning on making some. I know you're about to get oh, full yeah. gear making oh, yeah. some. I'm, I'm making this more vests. <laughs> this is my time of year. Vests and scarves. Um, okay, so glad seeing you guys. Stay tuned for next week where we'll see you same time, same place. It's always a pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. Gentleman Jim McFarlane here, the tailor. Victoria Baylor, your professional dressmaker. We'll see you next week. See you guys. Bye.